Um, and like before we start, who already feels comfortable with the idea of like static site generation? If you could raise your hand, and it's totally okay if you don't. Okay, awesome. And then who? Yeah, who? Who's like? And then who's like already familiar with like different like web performance metrics, like first meaningful paint or things like that? If you raise your hand. Okay, cool. Kind of most people. That's totally fine if you didn't raise your hand. We're gonna like go through all of these things as well. Just helpful for me. Um, who loves web performance? Every hand, every hand goes up, awesome. Okay, cool, uh, great. Maybe after the talk they'll all go up. Um, <laughs> cool, so the title of this talk is Statically Generating Performance. Uh, that's me, as Sergey said, I'm Tim Brown. Yeah, that's my Twitter uh, avatar. That picture was taken at Disneyland. I was really happy in it, so it makes Twitter like a, a happier and more like optimistic place for me. <laughs> um, and that's my handle, you can follow me on there. Cool, so we're gonna be talking about a few different things today. Um, we're gonna start off with like some of like the history of Harry's. Um, that apostrophe is not a typo. That's like a thing we do at Harry's where it's like H apostrophe. So it's like Harry's history. Um, we're gonna look at some like traditional rendering approaches, so like server side rendering and client side rendering, and like how we use those on Harry's.com. Uh, then we're gonna look at static rendering, which is what we used for Flamingo, and like some of the benefits and like trade offs of that. Uh, we're gonna talk about like optimizing the rest of of the Flamingo site, so things like fonts and images and all sorts of fun things there. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about like automation and measurement, uh, so like monitoring and some of our process around this. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna end with the why, which is my favorite part of this. So let's dive in with some history. Uh, so like I said, I work at Harry's. We are a men's care brand. Uh, we sell like razors and face wash. Uh, we have this new body wash that I really like. Um, and Harry's has been around for like six years. We launched in 2013. Um, but last year, something really, really exciting happened uh, for us, which is that we launched the first new brand since uh, Harry's itself had launched, and this was Flamingo, which is a new women's body care brand. Um, and this was super exciting to us, like not just as a business, because you know it was like the first new brand since Harry's itself had launched six years ago. Um, but it was also really, really exciting to us as engineers, because we got to take like the collective like six years of experience we had like building and running Harry's and like take all of those ideas and knowledge and like use them to make this like totally new site um, and like change all those little things that like would have been hard to change in like a big existing application. Um, so that was super exciting to us. Uh, and we knew we had some goals for this site and for the launch. Um, we wanted to deliver like a mobile first, highly interactive experience. Um, we knew that these customers were mostly gonna be on mobile devices and we wanted to, the, the site to just like feel nice and modern and very interactive. Uh, we knew that we, we're gonna really need scalability and web performance out of the box. And I'm kind of intentionally drawing a distinction between these two. So uh, on the scalability front, like we knew we were gonna launch to like a ton of press and like there'd be a lot of people coming to it on the first day. Um, and you know, just in general as an e-commerce company, when we do like an ad on TV or send a bunch of emails to our users, um, we can get like big spikes of traffic. So it's important for, to us that our sites can you know, be very scalable. Web performance is also super, super important to us as well. Um, as an e-commerce company especially, uh, web performance impacts our conversion rate. Um, you know, if the site's like slow to load or it feels janky to users, they're gonna leave or get frustrated um, and we don't want that. Uh, and it also affects SEO, so your ranking in Google search. A couple years ago, Google actually uh, started taking into account on mobile search um, how performant your site was, and that actually impacts your search ranking. And SEO is a really important part uh, of our web presence as an e-commerce company, so we knew we, we needed web performance. And just to give you a bit more backstory on like the architecture of, of harrys.com, uh, which is a little bit different from Flamingo. Uh, so Harry's itself launched in 2013 to, to a fair amount of press. Um, it was originally uh, built on top of Magento, which is this open source e-commerce framework. Um, that like press and the initial, initial traffic actually crashed the site on its first day. And so we really didn't want that to happen uh, with, with the Flamingo launch. Um, and harrys.com was pretty quickly rewritten as just like a pretty standard Rails app. Uh, it still has like a pretty monolithic architecture. So uh, the front end and the back end are fairly coupled together. Like most of it's just going through Rails. And for a long time, like for harrys.com before Flamingo, like most of what we thought about when we thought about um, performance at all was really related to scalability um, and like server performance. Um, so we used, and we still use like a product called New Relic, which is a really great product that gives you lots of like performance data about your servers. Like on this graph, you can see things like um, 
the amount of time it's spending in the database or in Ruby. Um, and this is really valuable for like tracking the performance of your servers, but it actually it doesn't. It's like a pretty narrow slice of performance data. Like it doesn't track anything about what happens on your site once uh, a page has been loaded by your users. Like it's not tracking anything about like what's happening in your users' browsers. And so we were sort of missing a lot of information about how our sites actually performed. Initially, like a lot of the pages on Harry's.com were written as like standard like Rails ERB templates, and those were like server rendered, so they were mostly like HTML responses. Uh, and then over time, or for like more interactive areas of the site, um, we were writing things in MooTools. Has anyone here ever used MooTools? A couple of people. Yeah, you don't need to use it. Like we, <laughs> you're not missing out on anything. That was sort of a very early uh, decision uh, that we uh, replaced with React uh, several years ago. Um, but yeah, for like our more interactive pages, doing those client side rendered. But as we were, so we sort of gradually over a period of a couple of years started writing more and more of our UIs in React. Like we really like React, and we started to notice, like while that was really nice for us as developers, we started to notice some like layout jank on our pages. Um, and I have an animation of this. So like, you can see like when this page loads, like the header and the footer kind of come in, and then like this uh, thing jumps in, like the hero, and you know, this is kind of a weird loading experience for a user. Like things are jumping all around. It's like kind of confusing. It's not a great experience. Um, even though like kind of, this is not super uncommon on the web today, like it still felt not ideal. And this was kind of the point where we realized like, okay, we need to sort of deepen our understanding of like performance to go beyond just like the server. We need to actually take a closer look at how our site is performing uh, in a user's browser. Uh, and to do that, we wanted to start with our, our page rendering architecture and really understand what was going on there. So we're going to talk about some traditional rendering now. So first, we'll talk about server-side rendering. And some of you may already be familiar with this, but we'll go through it anyway. So in general, in like a traditional server rendering architecture, you have a user and you have a server. And a user will make a request for a specific page. So in this case, it would be like the harrys.com blades page. It's one of our product pages. Uh, and the server has, a, has access to a couple different things. It has some data, and it has uh, some page templates. Uh, and the server's role here is really to, to find like, the specific piece of data that it, uh, is being referenced by that request. So in this case, it would be like our, you know, our Blades product might have like, a name and a price and some images. Uh, and then find like, the specific page template. So for us, it would be like, the product page template. Uh, and it's going to take those, those two things and sort of bind that data into that page template and write out a big like HTML file. Uh, and that you know, would probably look something like this with server rendering, where uh, most of the like, actual content of the page, the layout, the different components are described in sort of plain HTML. There's some CSS in there. And then the server, after writing that, is going to return that to the user. Uh, and this has a lot of, like, this is a super common approach, and it has a lot of sort of good things going for it. Like, there's a reason why it's a very common approach. Um, the, the sort of conceptual complexity of this approach scales pretty well. Like whether you have, you know, five pages or like 500,000 pages, like the process would kind of look the same here. Like if we had tons of different products, like all that the server would need to do is like find that specific product in the database, put that in the product page template, uh, and it would it would work. So that's that's really appealing. Rendering your pages, like delivering mostly HTML to clients, um, also leads to like a really quick initial render of the page. It kind of gets around that problem we were looking at in the animation. Um, and that's also really nice. And this is related to uh, a web metric called first meaningful paint. Um, this is the time it takes for primary above the fold content to render for a user. And like that word meaningful is like a little bit squishy. Like what's meaningful for you know, one site or page might be different for another site. Um, but for us, you know, we would, we would probably count this as like the time it takes for that, that video itself to render in. Like that's when the user is getting like the main like content of the page. Um, there are also some cons associated with server rendering. So uh, this might seem obvious, but like if, in order to do this server rendering, like you do actually need to have some servers in the loop that are capable of, uh, of generating those pages. Uh, and as your traffic increases, like you generally do need to scale up the number of servers you have in order to um, serve all of that traffic. And there's lots of different ways to optimize that. Like you can use different types of caching to reduce that load on your servers. Um, but at the end of the day, like you still need a server in the loop there to generate those pages. Uh, and that's like this part of the diagram. Like you need the server 
it's happening in the request response lifecycle, generating these pages in response to user requests. And that process takes time to, to generate those pages. Like, because it's in the middle of that cycle, like, if, you're, if your server was really slow, um, that could slow down the entire sort of process of those pages being able to be served to users. Uh, this is related to this other web metric, which is uh, the time to first byte, which is, you know, the time between the initial request being made and initial data being received. So in this chart, it would kind of be like this whole cycle, like from when that request got kicked off to uh, when it initially started getting served back to the user. It doesn't really say anything about like what happens uh, to the page like in that user's browser, but it's sort of a, a metric about like you know the round trip time of that. And if you had a server that was being slow in that process, it would slow it down. Uh, the distance from a server can also affect this time to first byte metric. Um, so let's say we had a user in Australia and they were making a request to our server in Virginia, like the latency of that request still needs to travel all the way across to get there. And you know, again, there's ways of dealing with that with server rendering, but it can affect the time to first byte in a sort of like naive server rendering setup. Cool, so let's talk about client-side rendering. So in a lot of ways, client-side rendering looks fairly similar to server-side rendering. It's really the main differences in like the mix of, of content types that you're sending back to users. So instead of just sending like a mostly plain HTML um, response, you're also sending a bundle of JavaScript. And instead of having most of the like markup and layout of the page defined in HTML, you're just defining it in JavaScript instead. And so instead of something that looks like this, that HTML response might look something more like this, where um, you know there's relatively little HTML. You're defining your uh, what your pages look like in JavaScript, and all of that's in that bundle.js. And so why would you do this? Um, there's also a lot of good reasons to do this. So the first one is like you get to write your pages in JavaScript. You get to use cool frameworks like React, like be one of the cool kids, <laughs> um, and and that's a totally valid reason like I know for us like sometimes we'd start off like building a page to be server rendered and then we need to like gradually add more interactivity and then at a certain point it was sort of like well we kind of need to like refactor the whole thing to be in react and having to sort of pick and choose between um, you know authoring an HTML versus JavaScript like sometimes it's nice to just write everything in, in React. And also like depending on how you do this, this can start making it easier to decouple your front end and back end. So if you sort of wait to fetch the data that you need for a page until the JavaScript is mounted on the user's device, um, you can set up some APIs in your back end and start to sort of decouple um, that that rendering, which can be nice for other reasons too. Uh, it also has some like noticeable cons going against it. Uh, so the first meaningful paint can be a lot slower uh, with JavaScript than with plain HTML, and that's actually that, that's really what's happening in this GIF. So you can see that uh, the header and the footer, those are both being server rendered, and so they get painted to the screen really, really quickly. Um, and the rest of the content in the middle of it is actually being client side rendered. So we're sort of like mixing our approaches here, and you can really see like how much slower it is uh, for the client side rendered content to be rendered than the server side rendered content. And so that's not great. That's kind of like the root of this problem that we were trying to diagnose. And this is really because JavaScript is the single most expensive asset you can ship. Um, it's a lot more expensive for browsers to, to parse and execute this JavaScript than it is for them to do like plain HTML or CSS. And so, you know, while you get to like write your UIs in React, like this can actually really slow down your page rendering for your users. And that's not great. This is an example. This is the <laughs> image for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'm guilty of this too. I love JavaScript. It's amazing. Like, <laughs> it's super fun. But yeah, like you, you know, everything in moderation. Another thing that can happen is that like uh, page interactivity can actually suffer with too much JavaScript, which is like a little bit counterintuitive, right? Like we we add JavaScript to our pages to make them interactive, but if we add too much, it actually can make interactivity suffer. Um, and this is because JavaScript is is single threaded, and so if you're sending just a whole bunch of JavaScript down, like the browser is going to be busy like chewing through all that, and then if a user clicks on like your drop-down menu or some other interactive element, the browser might not be ready to respond to user input, uh, and that's no good. Uh, this is related to a metric known as timed interactive, which is the time it takes for a page to be ready to respond to user input. Cool, so we can kind of start to, these, these are emojis, Google Slides just isn't rendering them as emojis, so those, those are eyes, um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we can kind of like construct this like checklist of these trade-offs, right? And like neither of them really comes out super on top for all the things we want. Um, so from a, a serving perspective, like time to first byte, you have to make sure your server's not too slow, otherwise that'll affect that. With client-side rendering, if you've decoupled your front end and back end, you can kind of get around that a little bit. 
Uh, from a rendering perspective, server-side rendering is always going to be client-side rendering. Like plain HTML, CSS is really fast. JavaScript is slow. Interactivity-wise, same sort of story there with client-side rendering. You just really need to be mindful of how much JavaScript you're sending. Uh, authoring, like we would love to write everything in React. We don't really want to write things in like Rails ERB templates. Uh, and then from like an operational perspective, both of these look kind of similar. Like both approaches that we've seen were still generating um, pages in response to, to user requests. Um, and so you've had these servers that like scale up and they go down. It's a problem. So, okay, not a very clear sort of winner between these two. And so as we were like thinking more deeply about this and thinking about what we wanted and needed for uh, the launch of Flamingo, uh, we, we thought about our needs. And so we, we wanted to deliver a really good time to first bite and first meaningful paint. We knew that those metrics would be important to our users. And as we thought about like what we actually needed to do, um, so we talked about like with server-side rendering, you know, it, it sort of scales out to like five pages or 500,000 pages, but for us, like we have like 20 pages on the Flamingo website. You know, we have like a dozen products, like a home page, a checkout page. We honestly have like a pretty small number of pages, and they don't change all that often. Like we maybe update an image once a day or something, but like in general, our, our data is pretty static. We wanted to mi minimize the amount of like operational overhead and complexity that we would have. Um, we have like a decently sized team at Harry's, and you know, there's been times when like Harry's.com has gone down before. It's not super common, but We've had those cases where a server has crashed and then we can't serve requests. And so, you know, if we don't have to deal with this, like the overhead of running all these servers all the time, like that would be really great. And then lastly, pipe dream. Can we author all of our pages with React without like passing on these horrible performance, you know, uh, effects to our users? Yeah. And this got us thinking, you know, is there an alternative architecture or framework that, that would meet our needs and our, our desires for, for Flamingo? So this is static rendering. So static rendering for people who haven't encountered it before, in, in some ways it looks really similar to those other approaches. Like there's still a server, there's uh, some data, there's some page templates. Um, but you'll notice we're calling this like a build server now. And so the server is still sort of performing its similar role. It's taking that data and it's taking those page templates and it's binding them together and generating pages. Uh, but you'll notice like there's no user in this graph. Um, we can actually just do that same process, but instead of doing it in response to a user's request, we can just generate basically our whole site ahead of time. Uh, and so we can generate our blades page and our shave set page and our home page. Like just tell our server like, hey, loop through all of our data and our pages, generate them all ahead of time. And so that way when a user makes a request to shopflamingo.com slash blades, we don't need to have our server there to, to do it right then. Like it's already been built. Uh, that just gets looked up out of like a cloud file system, which is super fast, and returned to the user pretty quickly. And if you'll permit me an analogy here, I, like, I kind of think about the difference between these different rendering architectures as the difference between like a restaurant and like catering. So in, in a restaurant, this is like the traditional rendering approaches, right? Like you, you go to a restaurant and uh, someone takes your order and then they give that to the kitchen and then the kitchen starts making your meal and then they, they bring it back to you. And you know, if you've ever been to like a diner who has like one of those like really deep menus, like you know that they can do like all sorts of things, right? Like they can kind of make whatever you want. And that works really great, but like if you think about catering, if you want to serve like 5,000 people at one event, like it looks very different, right? Like you, there's a lot more like pre-prep going on. There's maybe like a more like slimmed down menu or something, but in general, like it just, it, it's a lot easier to serve lots and lots of people if you're doing this, some of this work ahead of time. Uh, you know, like kitchens can get backed up and then everything's slower. So that's, that's how I think about the difference between these two things. And so this is, the, this is when we found this framework called Gatsby, which we, we started to use. And Gatsby is a static rendering framework uh, that does some other things for us as well. It's built on top of React, so we get to uh, write all of our stuff in React. Uh, but then Gatsby is actually going to take that React and server render it for us into HTML ahead of time. So we get some of the, both of, like, the benefits of serving mostly HTML, but still getting to write things in React, which is really nice. Yeah, so we get to author things in React, render them to HTML, and then those get turned into static files, which can get served very quickly. And so we go back to our sort of checklist here. This starts to hit a lot more of the boxes for us. Um, you know, serving is really quick. There's no server in the loop there that we have to worry about. Um, first Meaningful Paint's really good because it's mostly HTML. Uh, we still have to be thoughtful about how much JavaScript we're sending down um, because we are writing a lot of JavaScript, but that's something we can uh, keep a close eye on. Uh, authoring in React and operationally, like we don't have any of these servers to manage anymore. That's really, really nice. And so we can look at the, the architecture for Flamingo. So uh, we have our code in GitHub and our data in Contentful. And so whenever 
a developer merges new code to GitHub or uh, a product manager updates some data in Contentful, um, either one of those things will trigger a new Gatsby build. Gatsby will build our entire site, turn these into like static you know, HTML files and JavaScript bundles and all of our assets, uh, and we can just host those on S3 and then ultimately serve them behind Fastly. We love Fastly. It's cool that Fastly sponsors this uh, talk, yeah. Yeah, and so you'll notice like we, we don't have any like servers that we're managing in this process. Um, we've sort of pushed, we've pushed all of our like latency and scaling and serving concerns onto Fastly, which is our CDN, which is like, that's what like CDNs are made to do is just serve things really quickly, like all over the world. Like it's, it's kind of the best and we don't have to really worry about it. Um, that's super nice. Uh, we can also set really long cache times on our assets. Um, so everything gets like an asset fingerprint and it also makes cache invalidation really easy, easy because uh, they'll automatically get invalidated if that fingerprint is different. So when we like publish a new version of the site, only the things that have changed will be invalidated. Um, and this is where like if, if you've used like server rendering with like edge caching before, like sometimes you kind of need to be on the hook for like okay, when this piece of data changes, then like go clear this entry out of the cache. Like for us, we don't really have to worry about that. We can just publish the whole site. Uh, things that have changed will automatically get updated. Things that haven't will stay in the cache, which is really great. And so that was all sort of about rendering. Um, there's lots of other sort of concerns in making a, a fast website outside of that. So we're gonna look at some of those next. Start with JavaScript, our friend, our good friend JavaScript. So yeah, like we said, JavaScript is the most expensive asset that you can ship, um, but Gatsby helps us out here a little bit. Uh, Gatsby can do automatic code splitting, so because it's um, statically analyzing and building our site, it can actually break these JavaScript bundles uh, into uh, what's actually needed for a given page, and that helps us make sure that um, you know we're not ever shipping more JavaScript than is necessary for a given page, and that happens automatically, and, and that's really nice. We also use, we use a tool called Bundlephobia. This is a really great website. Um, you can just type in any package that's on NPM, and it'll tell you both how large that package is, um, compressed and uncompressed, as well as how long it takes to download that package on different network types. Um, so this is a really valuable tool for like keeping an eye on how much JavaScript we're adding to our site. CSS. So one thing that we had seen on, on Harry's was that with traditional CSS or SAS, it started to get hard to know like which CSS was in use on a given page, like especially in like a six-year-old code base. There was lots of CSS. It wasn't a super easy way to tell if all of it was in use or not, and so people sort of just defaulted to adding new CSS just to be sure they didn't like break something on a different page. And we wanted to think about like how to avoid that with Flamingo, um, and so we use a library called Styled Components, which actually does that for us. Um, it will sort of code split our CSS on a component by component basis. This makes sure that like, we're not shipping any unused CSS on a given page. Um, Stout Components is a like CSS in JS library. Like when I first heard that, I was like, why would you write your CSS in JavaScript? Like JavaScript is so much more expensive than CSS. Like, uh, you know, that's gonna be so much slower when you could just do it uh, manually. But uh, what Stout Components actually does for us, along with Gatsby and server-side rendering, is it actually takes those styles that are written in JavaScript and then compiles them into plain CSS. Um, it injects them in like the head of our of our site. So you know these styles aren't even in like an external style sheet. They're just directly like inlined into the page, and that also helps to uh, make sure that there's never any time where you know our site. Uh, it, it helps keep those styles loading really really fast, which is nice. Images. So another thing we do um, and that Gatsby does for us is uh, resolution switching. So we want to serve different sized images to different uh, screen widths. Um, if you're coming to our site on an iPhone versus like a big 4K monitor, like you should get an image that is sized appropriately for your, for your screen width. Gatsby and also Contentful handle this pretty well for us. Um, so th this is, there's a great package called Gatsby Image that does this, but it's just built on top of this standard HTML um, image tag with like the source set and the sizes attributes. And so basically you just give a, uh, a list of different images at different resolutions and a few different sizes and the browser will actually do all of the work of choosing the best image to show for that device. You know, because this is automatically generated uh, from our CMS and because Gatsby's image library handles this for us, we don't have to worry about like uploading multiple copies of the same image, it'll just get generated for us. Um, we also serve WebP, so WebP is a more highly optimized image format than something like JPEG. Um, again, our CMS can generate these for us, uh, and Gatsby Image just serves these um, automatically to browsers who support it, but for browsers that don't, uh, we serve fallbacks to JPEG and things like that. Gatsby Image also does uh, lazy loading of images for us, so images that are below 
below the fold um, won't get loaded until they've been scrolled over, whereas images that are really important and at the top will get loaded immediately so that those still render really, really quickly. Um, you can see an image of this where like when the page initially loaded, there was only one image loaded, and then as you're scrolling, uh, new images are getting downloaded. And so this also helps to keep our pages uh, fairly slim and um, make sure that users are only loading you know, data that they're actually gonna use. Um, again, sort of taken care of for us here. Fonts. So we preload our fonts. We have a few different fonts on the Flamingo website. We do this to, to avoid, or to minimize the amount of time that we have text showing that doesn't have the fonts applied. Um, this is called the flash of unstyled text problem. Um, and again, this is just a pretty simple like HTML. Um, it's a link tag. You call it, you say rel preload, and you give it a path to an external asset. And you're basically just telling the browser like, hey, like this is a file that you're gonna need. Go ahead and start downloading it as soon as you see this, and like I promise you, you'll you'll need it later. And so, by doing that, you can actually speed up uh, the time at which these fonts start getting downloaded, so that when they do get rendered onto the page, um, they'll already be ready, which is really great. And we also subset our fonts um, based on which characters are actually used on our site. So. Most font files have characters for all sorts of different like symbols and like wingdings and you know all these crazy different uh, things. But you know on our site like most of the text is in you know like the English alphabet like plus numbers. Um, and so what we can do is actually just cut out all those characters that we don't use from our font files um, to make sure that those assets are even a little bit smaller, which is nice. And lastly, compression. So most websites compress their assets. Um, using a technology called gzip, which just helps to minimize the amount of data that's being sent over the network. Um, we do that as well, but we also um, compress our assets with Brotly, which is a different compression algorithm from Google that actually leads to about 20% smaller file sizes. Um, the trade-off with Brotly is that it actually, it takes a little bit longer to generate those more compressed um, assets, but for us, because we're just building the site ahead of time, like it's worth it to spend an extra 20 seconds in our build process to generate those even more highly compressed assets and then serve those to browsers that support them. Uh, we actually have a, a graph of when we introduced that change and we saw about a 20% drop in the amount of JavaScript we have, um, which was pretty cool. All right, let's talk about automation and measurement. So I think one takeaway from a lot of this is we've automated a ton of our performance and I actually think that's a really important thing about building and keeping a site fast. Like in some ways, I'm just like standing up here telling you about all the things that we didn't do ourselves. It's like, oh, well, Gatsby does this, and our CMS does this, and Fastly does this, and we don't really have to think about it. And like, you know, I actually think that's really important um, for, for a few different reasons. You know, people's like experience levels with web performance vary across a team, and maybe not everyone has the same level of experience um, in it. And like we looked at all those different asset types and like if any one of those things starts being unperformant, it can kind of drag the whole performance of your site down. And so the more you automate, the more you help ensure that like everything is sort of fast by default. I'm totally stealing Gatsby's like <laughs> thunder from their presentation next week. Yeah, that, I think that's a really important is like this theme of automation with web performance. I think it's also important from like a user perspective as well. So like working on performance and improving performance is definitely like a user facing thing to do. It, it helps users a lot, but at the same time, all the time that you're spending like manually tuning performance is time that you could be spending shipping other features, like for us, you know, letting people buy more razors or something. So, you know, having it be automated allows you to uh, not have to spend excess time dealing with these things manually. And in that vein, like keeping a site fast is just important as as building it fast, if not more so. Like we said, like there's lots of things that can kind of sneak in and start dragging your site's performance down and monitoring is a really big, uh, performance monitoring is a really big aspect of making sure that your site continues to stay fast and that you have an idea of where it's currently at. And so there's, there's two sort of main types of per performance monitoring that we use. Um, the first is called synthetic monitoring. Um, so for those of you who haven't, use that before. Um, synthetic monitoring is really good for seeing trends in your site's performance. So basically the way it works is you take a snapshot of your site on some cadence, like maybe every day, compare the performance of your site over time using like the same device. So uh, synthetic is also sometimes called like lab performance um, because it's like very sort of, it's always the same device um, and it allows you to track your performance over time. And that's in contrast to real user monitoring, which works a little bit differently where you put a little snippet of JavaScript into your page and actually track the, uh, the real performance characteristics that your users are seeing. And that's really, really valuable for um, getting insights about what real performance characteristics your users are seeing um, and also helping you to make sure that like the sort of reference device that you're using for your synthetic monitoring is actually 
accurate with respect to like your users. And so we used a tool called Speed Curve for both of these. Um, it gives us all these nice dashboards with different sort of performance metrics about our site. Um, there are tons of metrics. Um, it lets us do a couple other cool things too. There's some study that says like when comparing like the speed of two things, something needs to be about 20% faster than something else in order to be like noticeably faster. Um, like users don't really perceive speed differences between two things unless one's 20% faster. And so what we can also do here with our synthetic monitoring is actually take snapshots like not just of our site, but also of other big e-commerce sites or competitor sites and make sure that like we are actually clocking in faster than than their websites, you know, helping, you know, our users like feel that that speed benefit. Like it should feel very fluid to use the Flamingo website. So this is a, a fun graph from that. So this is a graph of like first meaningful paint across a bunch of other different websites. Um, the ones at the top are other big e-commerce sites or some of our competitors, and that blue line at the bottom is Flamingo, which is really nice. <laughs> it's slightly misleading, but yeah, we're site's pretty fast and that it's nice to like have data like this to sort of back it up or show it to other people in the business um graphs like this really help i did not know that someone from amazon was going to be here so apologies for this but uh you know there's also like uh some like waterfall uh features in speed curve which are really great so you can actually you know see when uh different parts of the page are rendering you know they, they both end up like around the first meaningful paint really happens for both around four and honestly amazon's kind of winning in that first one um but flamingo starts rendering a little bit faster which feels good <laughs> Amazon's great, I love Amazon. <laughs> cool, so um, yeah, so there's a ton of web performance metrics out of there, uh, out there, and it can be kind of confusing a lot of time to like wade through them. Um, I think the one thing that we've found is that it really is best to focus on performance metrics that are directly tied to user experience. So first meaningful paint's a really good one, like that's the moment that that meaningful content gets painted to the screen. Um, something like time to first bite is not really a user experience metric, like it is related to the rest of them, but you know, it's, it's very sort of like the time from when the request goes out to when it starts coming back in, like it's not tied to things that users are actually seeing on a site. And so choosing metrics that are tied to user experience is really valuable. We, did, we ran into a couple different issues with like implementing real user monitoring on our site. One thing, and I don't know if this is like a speed curve thing or, or just a Safari problem, but a lot of um, like really valuable like user experience metrics in uh, real user monitoring are not implemented in Safari. And we have a ton of traffic from iPhones and so you know, we started getting this real user monitoring data, but a lot of it, what was available, available from Safari wasn't, weren't the most important metrics, um, and so that was kind of a bummer. Safari kind of drags its feet a little bit in implementing these web APIs, which is not great. Real user monitoring with single page apps uh, also means that you need to sort of define what, what done means on like uh, client side navigations. So with Gatsby, like the initial view that is served is HTML, but then after that, like when you navigate around the site, those are like, client side rendered um, views. You know, we can say like, oh, when that navigation is finished, like count that as done. Um, but we can't just like reuse the browser's built-in performance profiling uh, tools. And that was that was a bit tricky for us. Another tool that like we could probably be doing even more of is, is uh, setting performance budgets. Um, so this is a, a tool and a process that allows you to like align the business and engineers uh, incentives with, with those of users. So you can say like, hey, you know, for 90% of users, the first meaningful paint should happen in two and a half seconds. And like, you can commit to that and then set up alerts so that if your site ever does start going above that, you'll actually find out about it. It helps you sort of just keep this standard of, hey, like, you know, once you have this budget, like you can sort of start weighing other feature requests uh, against it. So like, if we wanted to put like video on our homepage, like would that make the site beyond our budget for our users? Like it allows conversations like that. We don't do a ton of this, although we do track most of this, so. That's another helpful tool that we could probably be doing more of. So yeah, why, why web performance? We're all at the web performance New York meetup. There's, there's gotta be some reason. Um, I think web performance is, is really fascinating personally, and I, I get the sense that it is to other engineers as well, maybe you in this room. Um, I think the thing I like about it the most is that it's, it's extremely quantitative, but also very qualitative. It's like left brain and right brain. You know, it's, there's like lots of very scientific measurements and specific timings and things. Um, but it's also very rooted in like human psychology and perception and you know, I think that that combination is just really really fascinating um, And also like when you give engineers a thing and say like make it faster like a lot of engineers will just kind of go off and do that and like that's really fun So yeah, I think web performance for engineers is a really really fascinating topic I think for businesses. It's also really important. So we looked at like e-commerce conversion rate or SEO and just like having a fast site means your users are gonna like your site more and being able to point to that data um, in your own company is 
is really important because it's not always clear what that connection is, um, and so it's a little bit incumbent on us as you know performance engineers to to do some of that education for people who know less about web performance and the benefits that it can have for your users and for your business. Really, I think I think the thing that web performance really is about, at least to me, is um, is users. And I think even beyond that, like web performance actually. It's more than that for users. Web performance actually determines which users can use your site. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So after we launched, uh, we got this really, really nice email from a Flamingo customer. She said that you know she's a very heavy online shopper. Uh, she lives in a small resort town in Grand Lake, Oklahoma, sort of a rural area. She buys literally every single thing she needs online. Um, you know, we can imagine there's like not a ton of like brick and mortar retail around her. She said a lot of like really nice things about her website, which is super sweet. Like it had a sense of a quick and uncomplicated transaction and it felt like it was built for mobile users like me, which like, yes, it totally was. We, we thought about that, you know, way ahead of this. So like, yes. So like this sort of made the rounds internally and like I read it and I was super happy and thought about how, you know, the web performance had helped affect this experience. And then I started to think about it a little bit more and it, it started to make me a little bit like sad as well. Like I, I thought about like what this person's experience was on like the web most of the time, and it was it was definitely not this. So most websites out there like aren't really built with performance in mind. You know, I think that like us as engineers, um, you know, we have our like fast MacBook Pros and like Office Wi-Fi and New York City like cell networks, and you know, most sites out there on the web for us are really fast. Um, but for users in more rural areas or with like less access to the latest devices or you know, anything like that, like a lot of the web is, is really unusable. And so like for, for this person to have such a good experience on our site just made me think about like how most websites aren't built to serve users like her. And I think that this is the most sort of important point about web performance to me is that by building your site for performance, um, it actually allows you to serve all users, um, especially those users who are so typically like forgotten about on the web today. Thank you so much. And do Q and A. Pretty sure with WebP, that's Chrome only right now, correct? It is Chrome only. Yeah. And how about better GZip? Same. Uh, yeah, also Chrome only. But for both of those things, we serve like fallbacks, either GZip or like JPEG to Safari. Really, doesn't support those. Well, I, I kind of figured I was just, you know. Yeah. Confirming. Yeah, no, it'd be great if Safari would implement all these great. Yeah, user the new it's things. the new Internet Explorer six. That's what it is. It really feels like it. Yeah. So uh, I have a couple of questions. The first yes. one, um, I'm wondering how you handle A/B testing. Is it yeah. all client side, or how will you go about handling server side of having like two different versions of the HTML yeah. surf at the same URL? Yeah, that's that's a fantastic question. So we currently don't do any A/B testing on Flamingo, um, unlike Harry's where we do do a lot of it. Part of that is just because Flamingo is a newer brand, so like we're building up our audience more. But like, yeah, that's a that's a great call out that like um, you could do your A/B tests client side. Like that would not be ideal for us because then you'd be you know, we've spent all this time like making our rendering super fast, like doing it all in JavaScript, especially if it was like a really big A/B test, um, like significant layouts being changed, that would not be great. Um, we have a lot of ideas for how you could sort of ahead of time statically render like yeah different variants of the site, um, basically generate like two or three or four different versions of the site, and then in Fastly or at the edge, sort of direct users to that version of the site. Um, I think that's going to become much more popular in the coming years. Like a lot of like Fastly and a lot of other edge providers are starting to add a lot more like compute capabilities out there. And so like I'm really waiting for the first like edge focused A B testing framework or like I don't know, we might end up having to like build something like that at Harry's. So yeah, that's it, a really great call out. Like you could do it client side or you could pre generate the site, direct them at the edge to which one. Um, that kind of brings me to, because I, we would try to do something like that and yeah. as, as, as we scale and you have so many different versions of the same page, yeah. you know, um, I wanted to ask you, how do you handle rollbacks and how long does it take? Yeah, in terms of A-B testing or like for us currently? Like there was a huge bug and you just need to roll back to the yeah. previous version. So for us currently, it's actually super easy. So what we do is, um, so when we publish new versions of the site, we actually, we have like a, a basically a, a dictionary at the edge um, and like put a little marker to like what version of the site it is. And so that's the thing that determines, we have like every version of the site kind of that was, like most versions of the site that were ever published. And so for us, like pointing people to a different version of the site is as simple as changing that current version value at the edge. Um, and so a rollback for us 
is actually pretty instant. Like it's one of the really nice benefits of, of this approach. So um, on S3, you just have it like folder by version? Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. In S3, there's just folders by version. In Fastly, we keep a record of like the current version and like other versions, and that's the thing that actually decides which version you get pointed at. Okay. And so doing a rollback, you just say point it to the previous one. And it's really nice. That actually makes me have another question. Okay. Do we have any retention policy? Any retention policy? Of like how many, many versions, versions do you keep? Yeah, so at the moment we're just keeping most of them. There is a limit in Fastly um, of like a thousand entries in one of those keys, and so uh, that's kind of like the soft cap. Um, in some ways it's really nice to have like lots of versions of the site. It, like it's also true for our staging branches as well. So like basically every staging branch that we've ever made internally um, has gotten just built into its own sort of static staging branch of the site. Um, we haven't needed to clear any of those out. Um, and for us, it's mostly like nice to just have all these old versions of the site. Um, but I imagine at a certain point if space was a concern or like it, the cost is pretty cheap so we don't really care about it. Um, we don't currently like do any much like active clearing out of old versions. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, could you talk more about um, how your CMS is integrated and how you went about choosing Contentful as your CMS? Sure. Yeah. I know the people from TakeShape are here in the audience too, and TakeShape is really cool too. We we've trialed them out for a bit, so definitely check out TakeShape as well. Um, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Um, so for us, like, we I think we chose Contentful because we it was like one of the first ones we'd heard about. Like they're fairly big player in this space. Um, we liked the integrations they had with Gatsby, um, from the image rendering stuff to, uh, you know, all sorts of things. Um, they have a couple cool features that we use a lot, um, like they have this new like rich text feature, which is really neat. Um, but in general, I think it was just one of the larger ones at the time we were sort of choosing it. I, there's a ton of CMSs now, um, each with like sort of their different trade-offs and like pricing structures and stuff. Um, I, I think a lot of them are, are really great and it probably, you know, when deciding on a CMS, like I'm definitely like very pro like third party headless CMS, like so much better. Like we used to, we still like maintain our own custom CMS on harrys.com and like that's not a lot of fun. Um, so definitely pro third party CMS. Like I think there's lots of probably trade-offs to each one. Um, probably comes down to like price and individual features. Part of your build process, you create the uh, uh, gzip and broadly version. Yeah. And then the, the, the S3 or web server takes care of what to sell or it's fastly doing that. So yeah, so we build, uh, we build the site. Uh, we compress those files both with gzip and broadly. All of that, like compressed with gzip, compressed with Broadly, uncompressed, just gets uploaded into S3. Um, and then uh, Fastly has S3 as a backend. And so when people are connecting to like shopflamingo.com, uh, they get routed to Fastly. And Fastly uh, most of the time has like the site in its caches. And so it just serves it directly out of Fastly from like a Fastly node that is geographically very close to the user. Um, but when the cache is empty, then it'll fetch it from S3. Um, and we will pick which compression type to, to choose based on which like browser it's coming from. So if it supports Broadly, we'll send them a Broadly asset. If it supports gzip, we'll send it gzip. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it just uh, request has the support and you so Yeah, yeah, I, th there's, I think there's okay. a like accept header that we accept can read and just do that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good, thank you, of course, yeah. Hey, uh, quick question, I think this is great coincidence that um, I actually traveled from India for some performance thing only. And uh, I'm like attending this event as well. Okay, so a uh, quick question. You mentioned that you're using, uh, so for Contentful is generating multiple image versions, yep. right? So what is the role of Gatsby? Because, um, so is, isn't it the CMS which is generating the images? So what was the Gatsby's, what, what was the role there? Yeah, that's a great question. So Gatsby um, has a package called Gatsby Image. It's It's not like, related to Gatsby. I mean, it is related to Gatsby because they um, maintain it, but really the only, it, it has a lot of these features for us. The thing that like, the value that Gatsby's providing in this situation is that um, the way that you query content from, uh, from Gatsby is via GraphQL. And so Contentful actually publishes um, some like uh, GraphQL fragments that will fetch multiple versions of the image in a format that Gatsby image already understands. And so for us, 
when we're describing a page, we say, hey, an image is going to go here. Um, do the like Gatsby contentful image fragment query, uh, and then just plug that into Gatsby image. And so we don't have to think about like, you know, contentful is generating the images itself, but itself, but Gatsby is actually the thing that's um, transforming the data into a format that like their image library uh, understands. And so for us, it, it's extremely simple to just like take this like pre-generated data, take this library, plug them together, and then our images are like very very fast. Could it be only by using SRC set? I mean, within your React component, you could simply use SRC set rather than that plugin. Wait, sorry. Could it be done only by using what? SRC set? I mean, by fetch. Oh, from using like the sources. Yep, source set. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, you could you could totally do that. Um, okay. You would probably have to like write your own. I mean, you could like uh, call out to like the Contentful API itself and like get that data into yeah. a format and then like parse. Yeah, like, you could do it yourself and. You honestly don't even need Gatsby image to do that. Like source set is a, a feature of the image tag itself. Um, what Gatsby image is providing is like it, it hooks that process up very easily. It's doing like the lazy loading for you. It's doing like the WebP support for you. All of which you can do by hand with like picture tags. Okay. Um, but it's it's a lot easier to just like plug it in. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. A qu quick question uh, on the uh, on, on that uh, CMS uh, the authoring perspective, right? You mentioned that. For client side versus server side, uh, you had one take on the client side for authoring, while the cross on the server side. Mm -hmm. What was the perspective on that? Like, what is the difference, yes, like for authoring, really in both of these rendering? Yeah, I mean that one might be more of like a matter of personal preference. I think one, basically from our perspective, it was like um, we didn't really want to be in the business of like writing our pages in like Rails ERB templates anymore. Um, we had a couple instances where like we started off by having a page be written in like a Rails ERB template, and like that was really nice from a customer perspective because it would be server rendered and be very fast for them to load. But then like over the period of a couple of months, we would start adding more and more functionality and interactivity to it. And at a certain point, it would be this like, you know, you would have kind of almost built your own like vanilla JavaScript framework for this thing. Um, and so then at that point, we'd have to make a decision like, well, do we keep going down this path, or do we like refactor this whole thing to use React and switch it to client side rendering? And so, like by being able to start with like React everywhere as pages like need more interactivity, like that that path is much more gradual. Like you don't need to like rewrite it at some point like in React. Um, we, we maybe could have like balanced that more by like just using React for those little pieces um, that uh, needed that interactivity. There was a while where we had this bug on our site because of like. The version of MooTools we were using, like we couldn't have like MooTools and React on the same page, and it was just nuts. And MooTools is a mess. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, it just let us like sort of not have to make a decision about like, are we going to write it in plain HTML or like a Rails ERB template? We're just going to write it in React. But like the customers don't really pay the price for that. Thanks. Thanks, Rudy. Hey, uh, great presentation. Um, my question is about ROM. Um, yeah. I don't know, you mentioned New Relic. I don't know if you use that for that. Um, my question is more, like, how do you look at that data if you have any analyst or whatever or PMs look at it? Yeah, that? yeah, so our, our product manager was looking at a lot. We were looking at a lot as well. Um, there were some, there's like some different metrics that are captured between synthetic and real user monitoring. So um, first input delay is one that exists in real user monitoring. And that's that's like sort of the real user counterpart to timed interactive where like, it will actually measure like when users click on things what the delay is, um, and so that was really cool to see. Um, I definitely think like Speed Curve has this really cool graph of like load time versus bounce rate, so you can actually visualize like how much drop off are you getting from your performance. Um, and so things like that are really valuable. I think both for engineers and also for product managers or the broader business. Um, for us, it was just like because so much of our traffic is from like especially mobile Safari. Um, a lot of like the most valuable metrics weren't being captured there, um, and so yeah, it's it's like fairly technical data to analyze. Like you kind of need like a good basis in web performance, I think, to like analyze some of it, or at least that's what we found. And um, but it's also very valuable data too. So th this project looked like it was a huge success, and uh, <laughs> like it's, you know, hopefully everybody got raises. <laughs> um, what now that the project is sort of like in the maybe like more maintenance phase uh -huh. and, and past the launch, what would you do? You know, what would you do differently next time? And then mm. what are you guys thinking about doing on the main Harry's.com site? Like, would you just replicate the whole thing, or what, what were like any of the? Yeah, those are like? those are really good questions. So 
we kind of are thinking about both of those things, both because like Harry's is still like mostly a Rails like monolithic app, and like they're sort of in the process of of replatforming to something that looks more like this. Um, but we're also going to be launching like new brands in the coming years um, outside of like the sort of spaces that we've been in so far. Um, and so we are sort of thinking about like what are we going to do differently for the next ones. Um, I think one thing that we like we had this sort of luxury of like having everything be sort of like front end, client side rendered, like our team was like not um, responsible for any of the services. There was a separate like core team who built like the back end e-commerce APIs that we integrated with. Um, I think one thing that we're going to be doing more of in the future is um, using GraphQL for those like runtime API calls, like setting up something like Apollo in front of our internal service, like RESTful services um, and integrating with that. I think for Harry's, they are working to migrate uh, towards Gatsby, like, they do do a lot more A-B testing than Flamingo does, and so they actually need to solve that more up front. Um, I think internationalization is also uh, one that will be really, really important. Um, it like seems relatively clear, like theoretically, how you would do that with static sites. You would just sort of generate a different version of the site per locale, um, but like the nuts and bolts of that, of you know, connecting that to Harry's or to future brands, um, I think there's like work to be done in that space as well. And like CMSs, I think can play a really, really big role in that. Yeah, but in general, like tech stack wise, like we kind of got to pick the things we liked and are pretty happy with like almost all of them, which is like feels like rare. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> yeah. I actually have a question myself. Yeah. Uh, so now that you have a web, the fast website, uh -huh. how are you gonna build any other website in a different technology? I, that's honestly how I feel. Like if, <laughs> like Gatsby is so fun, like headless CMSs are awesome, um, it would be, I don't know. Like, I, I think that if there was a different type of site, like you could statically render a site with like a million pages, like uh, I don't know, Airbnb or eBay or something. Like, I'm sure you could do that, but like, I could also see a, a time where um, static rendering may not be the exact right fit for certain types of sites. And so, you know, that'd be a case where I wouldn't try to force Gatsby if like your build was like an hour long or something. Wait until their next feature. True, true. Out, right? Honestly, I hope they can. Is Meetup statically rendered? Y'all just got to build all your pages ahead of time, too. Is Meetup statically <laughs> rendered? No. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. If Only, a has his way, Only a hackathon project. Only a hackathon project. Yes. Not yet. Do you ship your uh, checkout as an, another? Uh, how you handle that part? Yeah, uh, yeah. That's an is... interesting question. Yeah. So, so, yes, we do ship our checkout um, in a similar way. Like that. There are parts of our site that are more dynamic. Um, the like our cart or the checkout page where you're actually seeing like we, we're not going to like generate, you know, checkout pages depending on what's in your cart. Like every permutation of products you, should, you could possibly have, like that would not make any sense. And so for things like that, or for like our order confirmation page, um, we generate. It, it's sort of like uh, this pattern called like the app shell, where like you generate like the shell of the page and then load that data um, dynamically or asynchronously. And Gatsby totally works for that. So you know, when someone goes to our checkout, we have their you know, cart state stored in local storage, and uh, we can like fetch the product images and data from that. Um, and so, like that, those parts of the site are more dynamic. Um, but like that totally works with Gatsby. And I think as we have, uh, with, you know, if we had features like subscriptions or um, more dynamic parts of the site, like that's the pattern we'll follow for that. But Gatsby totally supports that. Um, and honestly, those pages need like less like SEO or plain HTML anyway. So it's usually a pretty fine trade off. Thank you. So going back to the Amazon side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Hey, no, we no. use S3. We love S3. <laughs> no, no, it's totally awesome. I, well, that's, that's what I actually wanted to find out is, yeah. you know, do you think the pages are bloated or do you think it's just a number of users that we get monthly that make it load that slow? Because we literally have each month two point, oh, yeah. I mean, like two and a half billion visitors. Yeah. So yeah, no, what, is, what is that? No, seriously, I, I personally don't know the answer. What do you think that um, is? I don't know. Honestly, from what I've seen, we're not nearly the scale as Amazon, but from what I've seen, like, um, I imagine that I imagine that Amazon's using server-side rendering. Um, I imagine that server-side rendering those pages is pretty fast. Um, Amazon's site pages are not slow, by the way. Like that was that was just the only one that like Amazon was actually second in that whole comparison. So like it was second after Flamingo. So like. I also imagine at a certain point, like y'all have definitely done studies on like w at what point it makes sense to keep optimizing, and so it, it could be a case of, like over optimization on our part. Um, I would guess that the the primary like drivers of like the rendering performance are the images on the page, the amount of JavaScript. Um, I would look at those before jumping to like the server rendering part, because like generally like the difference between like 
100 or 200 milliseconds in the page generation has less of an effect on like the actual rendering than like the, the mix of assets and how much JavaScript, how many bytes of images and stuff. Right, because it was actually very interesting talking to my cousin Khalid here, and he talked about his company and how just shaving off just a couple of milliseconds yeah. will equal to millions of dollars of Yeah, cost. I think you know, Amazon like is the right? one that did that study that was like 100 milliseconds. I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's like 100 milliseconds equals 1% conversion bump, which like at big scale is a ton of money, so. Yeah. One word, WPO stats, that's where all of those articles are. Yeah. Uh, quick question. So two people actually hit on this, and I want to ask this question. Uh, so you have a, a site uh, that's fast and uh -huh. great. Now, have you, have you experienced a bottleneck at checkout after all of that? Interesting. A bottleneck, like in terms of performance at checkout? Like web performance? Right. I mean, in, term, I mean, in terms of uh, getting someone there, you know, someone added it to the cart, and then now at that page where they have to go through that checkout process. Yeah. Did you guys run any, um, do you have any stats on that where, you know, people would just... In terms of just like drop checkout? off at each like stage? Right, I, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, we totally do track that. Like Google Analytics kind of does that for us. Right. Um, uh, yeah, people do drop off like at that point. Like that's, I think that's fairly common in, in e-commerce sites. Like when... And, and the design of that page has a lot to do with that. Like if you're showing them like a bunch of forms at once versus like just like little um, individual forms at the same time. So like uh, we do track that, um, but some of that is inevitable. Like people like, you know, get to that page and maybe don't want to enter all their information or just sort of when they're actually being forced to check out, they don't want to. Um, but like no bottlenecks outside of like the usual just e-commerce sort of flow that like we model the funnel and see those drop-off steps. The, the reason I asked that is I was just on the site. So at checkout, you have two options. One is to create an account. Yes. And the other is the Facebook option. Oh, you're talking so, about on, on Harry's? On Harry's. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. On Harry's. Yeah. So was that a decision made uh, just to have that as the two only two options? Um, I think it, it's not an explicit decision to like just keep it to two. I think originally you could just log in with your email and then we added Facebook at some point. Um, one of the really important things about checkout for e-commerce sites is that like optimizations that you make there, if you increase like the conversion rate by like 5%, if you make it a little bit easier to check out, it has like a really outsized like massive effect on, on how much money you make. Um, and so uh, that was probably an A-B test at some point where we said like, well, if we add Facebook login, like does that make people check out more because it's easier? And you know, it, that probably is true. Um, and so I think ideally we'd probably have like lots of different options, like whatever is easiest for the user, but you also want to balance that with like not having too many options that they like get confused or drop off. And so it's it's kind of a balance, like especially on checkout pages, like everything is like very finely considered and A-B tested usually. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Great. And I'll be around after too.